<sighs> Welcome, everybody, to episode one of Brewer's Advantage, brought to you by Split Second. Today, we've given a couple weeks for uh, everybody and the Brewers to kind of look at the most recent sets that have come out and, and all the new cards, and we're going to break down some of our favorites, maybe some of the things we didn't like that came out in this set, and some things for you to consider uh, playing in your own CDH decks. So today, specifically, we are going to go over Karlov Manor, the Karlov Manor Commander decks, and the subset of Clue, the um, MTG Clue set that came out. So you will see cards from all three sets uh, today in the review. Um, and then hopefully while we are going through, we'll remember to each give a card a rating. Um, by the time we're done talking about it, we will probably say something like this card is either playable right now, maybe something you should test, or something that you should just skip. So, to dive right into it, we have our first card. This is from the Clue set, um, one of the legendary creatures that came out with it. This is Apothecary White. Um, Apothecary White is a 4 mana 3-4 with Vigilance and has two abilities. The first one says whenever you attack, you create a food token for each creature, nope, for each player being attacked, then you may pay one white, tap, tap X untapped foods you control, and then create that many 1-1 um, one, one white human creature tokens. So, um, this card really isn't that impressive out of the gate, uh, but it's kind of serving as our disclaimer that the mono white community can make a stacks deck out of anything. <laughs> and, uh, this card is not an exception. Um, being able to swing in at each of your opponents with something like a hate bear board uh, and then create some food tokens that your commander then, either on the end step prior to your turn or even that turn, will turn into three one ones. It follows that very typical um, play style similar to Heliod and the other mono white token generators, uh, where you know people can stack down a board, start to gain some advantage, and, and hopefully finish off a table. Now. I'll be honest. Me, personally, uh, if someone says they want to play mono white stacks, would I send them towards Apothecary White? No. <laughs> I don't think I would. But will somebody bring it up on the mono white Discord and ask whether or not they can have their own channel to talk about this? They probably will. <laughs> because it's a creature, it makes more creatures, and benefits you swinging out with a hate bear board. Like, it's just, it does what mono white does. Yeah, um, I don't know if you've mentioned uh, it does have vigilance, so you can swing in and then use the its uh, ability, and um, you do have to be uh, to take care, uh, take in consideration that uh, these will feed a lot of dark sides at the table. So, of course, you are already in stacks, but uh, that means you will have to prior prior prioritize. That means that you will have to prioritize. Um, uh, getting that uh, artifact hate uh, early on as, uh, as soon as you can, like uh, maybe Karn uh, or even Null Rod, um, so that your opponents are just not uh, going nuts. Uh, well, you can, of course, now there's another Hushbringer effect or another Torporal effect on this uh, set that we'll, we'll speak uh, soon over. So, um, uh, even if you're not into the Null Rod effects, that's uh, also another option that uh, you should take into consideration uh, as you are flooding the board with uh, food so yeah uh, if you want to, if you want to maybe just bring something different to a table and try to catch your opponents off card maybe that's an option and as a little bit of a, a disclaimer there were a couple other commanders both in i don't think there were any more mono white ones but there were some boros ones where you could look at them and argue that oh hey this could be another win conless stacks commander it does something adjacent to that plan um for the sake of the time of the video we're not going to go over every one of those options um that did come up we did note them while we were looking through the sets and be like oh look this is something that could potentially just be played in a in a win conless stacks build um you know with this card at the helm so apothecary white's kind of sitting as the not the pinnacle of it but here's our example of a win con the stacks option that came out of this set and we're probably not going to talk about any of the others because <laughs> there's uh, if it has combat it creates tokens you know congrats you you made a win con the stacks deck um anyway so for me personally my vote is going to be to skip it um mono white doesn't I mean, sorry, I love Mono White, I play Tayshar, but Mono White stacks 
specifically Apothecary White doesn't do anything that really hypes me up um, as being unique. What about you, Ba? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think you have better options. Um, you could try to venture into the blasting station routes of using the humans uh, to maybe uh, police the board a little bit uh, or just get some uh, flowering of the white tree I think uh, it's a good anthem they came out recently and protects a bit apothecary white and uh, also bumps uh, buffs your 1-1 uh, white human board so I don't, I don't think uh, that's basically you're already playing a tough archetype and with the, the, the hundredth card that you want, the, the commander, doesn't bring much to the table. If you say this is already a stacks piece that you can access on turn one, then go for it. Otherwise, you're already on a hard archetype to, to pilot and you are literally just uh, using the 99 to, to do something because the, the card itself, I don't think it brings much. Uh, basically, helps you finish. The, may, may, we, we can say it helps you finish the game, which is what stacks usually uh, struggles with. But even so, I don't think it helps you that fast. So yeah, it, I would skip as well. Admittedly, it does do cool things with altars. Um, like, does this commander yeah. help you ramp into uh, an Elish Norn or even a Calvary? Sure. It does. Alrighty, moving on to the next one, we have Delne. Delne, Delne, Streetwise Lookout. Yeah, so uh, Delne Streetwise Lookout, um, it's a legendary creature, so you can actually play it as a commander as well. Human Scout, 2-2, two, two, and it uh, reads, creatures you control with power 2 or less can be blocked by creatures with power 3 or greater. So it gives some sort of evasion um, as a static effect, and it has another uh, ability. If an ability a creature you control with power 2 or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. So basically it's um, like a, a roaming throne um, ability that... Uh, uh, when I saw this card I was a bit bonkers. It does cost 3. And uh, we've had some discussions where this could be a little bit of a, a win more card. I just keep finding ways where this... Um, this ability is uh, being cost just three, having just a, a three mana value uh, cost. I think it's uh, good to have access to such an effect at a lower um, on, on a lower mana curve. I think it in um, some decks that uh, have uh, less colors. If you're not um, on a four color deck, five color deck. I think for those decks you will have uh, a higher card quality to trim down to 100. I think you uh, can find uh, spots where this card can can just change the lines of the combos you want to do or basically give you a lot of, of value during a, a maybe a mid-range um, uh, strategy. <sighs> for me, this is landing in a test it slot in my mind. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the community about this being a little bit more on the win side, the win more side of things, uh, rather than being a completely necessary card. Uh, making your creatures with a power two or less um, unblockable by bigger stuff is good. It lets your Timnas get through Kroms and lets Delne and under a Timna board get through a larger, uh, a larger board state. That's cool. That is applicable in a lot of places. Um, the trigger doubling, when it comes to triggers, most of the time we're playing a card that has a triggered ability, it's because that single triggered ability lets us win the game with just it happening once, right? Like, with a high enough Dockside count, most CDH decks are built to win the game off of one Dockside trigger, and having two of them is amazing. You will... It might make a difference in some of your games, but for the most part, uh, CDH decks are built that they only really need one of those, you know, special triggers. Now, that being said, um, it really can just push a deck further beyond. Double Timna triggers, double Dockside triggers, double... Uh, insert any playable staple here that has an ETB effect or an on-attack effect. They're great. Um, 
but will Delne be the thing that you need to play in order to make your deck viable? Probably not. Um, so it's for me, it's landing in like a go ahead and test this. Um, I have seen some people say they even want to put it in the command zone and play maybe play more um, value based white creatures, something like Esper Sentinel, in order to get double draw off of it and other effects, or just even like removal effects, um, something like uh, what's the um, what's the three drop ETB exile a something your opponents control? Yeah. You know what I'm talking Skyclave about? Skyclave Apparition. Skyclave, yeah. Uh, so maybe even something like doubling a, a Skyclave Apparition, and they're going to try to put Delnay in the you know, the front of that, which is cool. Like, I, It's not quite landing in the you-need-to-play-this uh, category for me. It's landing more and test it and see what happens. Yeah, definitely. I think... Yeah, I think Team Na non non four color Team Na decks, of course. Uh, Mardu, maybe... Or I don't know, even Timna Malcolm perhaps uh, could benefit a lot. Uh, not yeah. Imagine Malcolm just triggering twice. Timna, I think I, th I think it's decent for uh, quite decent. I would and I would I think I'd test it and probably play it because I, I overall I do prefer a more uh, mid rangey approach to uh, mid rangey playstyle. So uh, something like a Team the Malcolm deck, I would, I think, I would definitely play it for just getting both triggers out of those two uh, commanders. Uh, you can, uh, you, you, you gotta understand also that uh, Gilded Drakes just pop out of nowhere every now and then, and then your Malcolm doesn't hit anymore, and now it can hit again through those and uh, through Talion. Um, there's. I think it's quite decent in up to three color decks. Maybe, hopefully, with a team in the command zone. But I wouldn't try it as a. It's fancy as a commander, but uh, I think it 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 it, it kind of. Um, it's depriving a lot of good other triggers from other colors. And now we jump to the next card, Doorkeeper Thrall. The Doorkeeper Thrall is two mana, it is one in a white, it is a 1-2 with flash, flying, and a wonderful ability that says artifacts and creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. So right away we can compare this to Hushwing Griff, Hushbringer, Torpor Orb, that's just what it is. It is another Torpor Orb effect, this time on a creature. Um, just as Hushwing Griff has flash this one also has flash but gets one less mana so we're almost looking at a strict upgrade and on top of that i believe hushwing griff i'm gonna look this up for a moment i think hushwing griff doesn't actually hit artifacts in the battlefield i don't think so it does nope. not it is only creatures so doorkeeper thrall extends a little bit beyond that and hits something else this card's really good <laughs> Um, whether or not you're in a hate bear deck, or uh, I think you could even go up to three colors and get some value out of this. Um, this card shuts off most of the main win cons uh, that you'd be looking at in CDH, such as Dockside Extortionist and Thassa's Oracle. Uh, it's got Flash to catch people unaware. It's a creature, which means it's harder to interact with. And it has two toughness. I think that if you are in a deck that is looking for hate bears, stacks pieces, uh, or even just some kind of uh, advantage uh, flyer, like you're playing something like Timna X. I think this card's amazing. Um, although if you're in Timna X, you're also probably in red, which means it would shut off your own Dockside Extortionist, and maybe that's not the best plan for you. Not dying to Bob Masters is a, a great, great upgrade to Ashen Grief. Uh, although, yeah, well, the Bow Master itself entering after wouldn't trigger, but any extra draws would, would kill such creatures usually. Uh, evasion also on flying, like uh, great for teamness if you are into that. Yeah, you, you could even play it maybe in a more uh, stacksy list, like uh, Rafine Skimming Seer. Um, or, um, and you, you gotta also remember that it also stops uh, artifacts. Imposter Mech gets you a Dockside Trigger over a uh, Torpor Orb, but not over this. Vague oh, okay, artifact. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in Imposter Mech and the new. Um, Four mana <clears throat> copy uh, effect the machine god's effigy. Oh, okay, machine god's effigy. 
Gotcha. So uh, in in Poster Mac and Machine God's effigy uh, would actually bypass uh, regular torpor orb effects, while this one actually uh, cuts them down. All the grinding station effects. Uh, so if if your opponent is going to through a breach line with grinding station, this also uh, stops the grinding station from untapping. So it's actually uh, it 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 goes up, goes wide. It's the power creep finally uh, hitting a torpor orb effect. So definitely definitely a playable card for me this is a play it this card is definitely something that if you are in these colors and in this strategy give it a shot that's great up next we have uh, trouble in pairs it's an enchantment uh, two colorless and two uh, specific white uh, pips and it reads if an opponent would begin an extra turn that player skips that turn instead so uh goodbye extra turns for uh, tv players i guess and it does have another line of text. It says, whenever an opponent attacks with two or more creatures, draws their second card each turn, or casts their second spell each turn, you draw a card. So you have three conditions uh, that um, will allow you to draw a card. Basically, um, <clears throat> an heuristic trigger, and they draw their second card. You also draw the card. Um, a second spell, and you also draw a card. And uh, those Timna players just uh, attacking with two creatures uh, to draw more cards, you also get to draw a card just on the attack. So basically, if you ha happen to find a removal, you can uh, even kill Timna to, to deprive them of their triggers. So um, I am a bit sad that this card costs four. Um, but yeah, white, white can get, uh, have it all. So uh, we already have a quite of... Um, can take an extra turn effects uh, available to us in CDH and actually I haven't seen them see play a lot but this one so I well this is not the I wouldn't say this is the best line for this enchantment what you really want I think it's the card draw of course the second line the first one is a bit of a um, uh, cherry on top of the cake especially when there's a lot of TV uh, players out there still uh, jamming the the same old uh, combo uh, but costing four we do have a smothering tithe uh, also costing four and seeing play in several decks so i guess um, in ov overall we can say cdh is, is not as fast as we sometimes might think of it uh, the average turn to to close the game is around six seven usually uh, based on some numbers you can you know, don't, don't quote me on that but uh, what I mean is four might seem a lot but it also might not so in it can it can see you can find some place in some uh, lower color decks I would say especially a stacks deck that um, usually tends to um, lack on card draw I would say I want to point out that uh, not only does this hit Tivit but thanks to uh, a certain really famous CDH pilot, Narset, is also uh, making a little bit of a splash again. And be oh, that as true. it is, Trouble in Pairs does hit that as well. Now, um, to be clear, I would never play a card specifically because it, hit extra, because it hits extra turns. That's just not and shouldn't be a priority for, uh, for people when deck building, unless you were talking about a very specific local meta. Then, of course, you know, if you're playing against Tivit, Narset, um, or some other type of extra turns combo regularly, uh, sure, by all means, go ahead and play uh, Trouble in Pairs because of that first line. Now, as far as the second, um, I don't want to break down each of those. You're probably not going to get attacked when this happens. Uh, if you drop Trouble in Pairs, even the Timna player will probably leave you alone. Timna might be satisfied with just your two other opponents because they don't want to give you card advantage. At least that's my thought. Um, casting their second, drawing their second spell each turn is um, a printing of Fairy Mastermind, right? So Trouble in Pairs yep. is covering, attacking with two, it's covering Fairy Mastermind, and casting a second spell each turn is uh, very similar to both Krom and Mangara, I believe is the, the white equivalent of Krom that doesn't see mm -hmm. any play, but could, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, again, for me, it's landing in uh, kind of a tested sort of sphere. I don't think this is an auto-include anywhere. I think if there is still um, a group of pilots that are playing a Staxier version of Sithis, there's a chance that this would be playable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
I want to point out that uh, when when we read stuff like this, if an opponent would take uh, would begin an extra turn, that player skips that turn instead. And we always think about uh, Tivit. Uh, you mentioned Narset really well. It's quite a recent um, uh, return of the card. I do love Edric, but no need to mention uh, that uh, it's just not a, a deck at the moment. The thing, though, is there's a lot of decks that actually win after Final Fortune. And um, Final Fortune, sometimes just I, I, I just we just forget that players not running Tivit or Narset do take extra turns thanks to Final Fortune and it's their like winning turn usually. So I I would be incredibly tilted if uh I had a win in hand and it relied on a Final Fortune <laughs> and there was a trouble in pairs uh in play, I would be very unhappy with uh with my existence if that was the case. Yeah, yeah. Up next is Unexplained Absence. Unexplained Absence is an instant that costs four mana, it's three and a white, and says for each player, exile up to one target non-land permanent that player controls. For each permanent exile this way, its controller cloaks, cloaks the top card of their library. Um, and then cloaking a card is uh, just flipping it face down as a 2-2. Two -two. And if it is a creature, they, they could turn it face up again. Um, and that creature has ward. So a big reason we wanted to look at this was because nowadays, with just how valuable each CDH deck is becoming, Odds are, when you try to go for a win, there could be more than one piece that is trying to stop you. Um, when this happens, blue decks have the option of just overloading a Cyclonic Rift and removing everything that's stopping them, such as, you know, enemy Rhystic Studies, something you're trying to go for a, a Storm turn. But other decks that aren't in blue might not have that option. So we'll see this in Golgari when players will slam Culling Ritual because they want to wipe an entire board of the pieces that are probably holding them back, like a Draneth Magistrate or a Mystic Remora. Um, but again, there could always be just more than one thing that you need to remove. An unexplained absence is that, uh, that window for, hey, about to go to my turn. I have open mana for a Thrasios activation or something anyway. You have four open mana and you want to be able to just pick apart um, what your opponents can, you know, stop you with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Being an instant, I think it's uh, quite, uh, makes the card possibly uh, playable. Um, there's, we need to test whatever we, we can do about it. Uh, if you're in uh, low colors, you don't have access to blue or to some other, I wouldn't say mass removal, but uh, pieces that, uh, cards that can remove you more than one um, permanent, then um, then this, I think it's good to take in consideration. Um, it does exile them forever. We can compare it to a, a Grasp of Fate effect, what which is a card you perhaps could see it in Zerdex and nowhere else other than maybe some stacks lists. Uh, the thing is, Grasp of Fate does bring the cards back, and you you can also be um, um, surpr not surprised, but you can also be taken uh, by, by surprise actually by with a Bazaju on the Grasp of Fate, where here you just get rid of those pieces forever, and then uh, you can try to go for your win. You are, although you are do giving them um, uh, something back, the two two creatures. Um, well, it it you are giving them back, but maybe not that much. What I mean is, uh, usually the CTH creatures you want or you have in your decks, they are usually if they are good ones, they will have usually ETB effects. So. Maybe you are actually putting a Gilda Drake or a Dockside or a Thassa's Oracle cloaked, and then it's the, the person will have to bounce it or do other stuffs to get access to it. Otherwise, maybe it's a Dork, or who knows, it's an Ad Nauseum and it just stays there. So, I wouldn't say as a completely drawback that you're cloaking a, a card for each opponent, and um, it, it just pains me a little bit that it costs four, but it's an instant, so I, I would I would give it a try for sure. I would do the same thing. Um, I think especially, like you said, it's really important to consider what you could hit off the top with this. Uh, if you hit a creature that has an ETB, I would consider that a success. If you hit any non-creature, I would consider that a success, because they can flip it up and they just get a 2-2 creature. So if you end up 
Nowadays, CDH decks are so good that getting rid of something that your opponent has permanently is great, even if it replaces it with a creature. We still play Swan Song, we still play Skyclave Apparition. Those things give you um, creature tokens, you know, when they resolve and, and end up removing something of your opponent's. Unexplained Absence will end up hitting not only the thing that your opponent had, but it could end up hitting something even better. Now, it's a gamble, right? If you end up hitting something really good off of your opponent's board, that's unfortunate, right? If you end up hitting a Talion or uh, a Ranger Captain of Eos, a Grand Abolisher, that's actually the worst thing on the planet. <laughs> hitting a Grand Abolisher would be so bad. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a toss-up of and maybe you don't end up hitting that and you end up hitting something good for them. So this could be a one card for three. Um, just from the, the pieces you removed from your opponents, it could be one for six, because if you get three really good hits from your opponents, you could also use it to advance your own board. So this is for each player and not for each opponent. So you can hit your own stuff. Now, why you would want to do this? <laughs> Maybe um, you, you can set your own uh, Grand Abolisher there. You yeah. will only tutor, and then you unexpectedly absent. Well, things are happening. Players will see the writing on the wall, but who knows if you have the counter magic to back it up. or uh, And then you get a Grand Abolisher into play this way. Yep, you could get an uncounterable Grand Abolisher into play this way, um, or just some other value creature. You could also use this to remove your own One Ring, if it's getting a little uh, too too dicey on your end, as far as life totals. I know that you specifically, you uh, you really like stuff that can remove your One Ring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some had uh, for you viewers, you you can watch a, a recent video. Uh, with some strange commanders, it was a funny, funny outcome to try to get rid of my own one ring, not to die. Right, yeah, it's our Christmas episode. I think it was our second Christmas episode this season. Yeah, you can yeah. see, you can see Baal really struggle with uh, staying alive under the one ring. Okay, but yeah, for me, it's ending up in a, a test to kind of phase. I think um, if you were playing like Heliod's Intervention in the past, for like big board removals, this could be a really easy swap in. Okay, up next is Unyielding Gatekeeper. Yeah, so we have a uh, an elephant cleric, a creature, a 3-2 uh, creature that costs one generic and one white. It has these guys too, uh, being a white and a, a colorless. And uh, that means you may cast this card face down for three, like a morph usually. But uh, it has, it is a two-two creature with no um, no creature types, and it has ward two. So uh, and then you can turn it face up anytime for its disguise cost. So uh, basically, you are it's an upgraded morph effect. Um, and then it reads: when unwielding gatekeeper is turned face up, exile another target non-land permanent. If you controlled it, return it to the battlefield tapped. Otherwise, its controller creates a 2-2 white and blue detective creature token. So basically, you can see it as a uh, way to blink your... Um, it's a versatile card, you can blink your own stuff, uh, or you can um, exile something from an opponent. Um, do you find uh, some good, uh, good things for it? Me, personally... I'm having a hard time looking at this card super favorably in comparison to Soul Partition. So Soul Partition's a two mana instant that exiles a non-land permanent and then uh, they can replay it, but if it's an opponent's, it'll cost two more for them to cast it. And if it's yours, uh, it doesn't cost anything more. So Soul Partition has a similar level of versatility where, for example, on my turn, um, if the thing that's really stopping me is, say, a Dranith Magistrate, um, I can Soul Partition away my opponent's Dranith Magistrate, and not only will it cost them two more to cast, but because it's a creature, they have to obey uh, timing restrictions, and they won't be able to cast it on my turn. And so I can, you know, from that perspective, it was removal. From the other side of things, I could Soul Partition my own Dockside Extortionist, and then recast it for two mana. Um, 
I think as far as costs come out, it would be three mana for the cast of Unyielding Gatekeeper and then two mana for the Disguise Flip, so it would be five mana total to, say, get another Dockside Trigger. Whereas for Soul Partition, I think it would only be four mana. So I think for me, unless I was specifically looking for a creature that would fill this slot or perhaps a uh, an effect that is much harder to counter, I would end up sticking with Soul Partition. I could see... Uh, more play either as a stacks on a stacks list because maybe you are uh, running Deafening Silence or you are running Archon of Emeria and then you have that window to exile something and still do something in, on your turn or um, or even blink something that you do want on your side of the table and um, being also being able to to go for this effect on a on two different uh, turns, say, like you morph it, you disguise it first, and then later on a different turn you use its ability for two. So I think these could be it could be seen play maybe on a Staxi list or something that wants to um, have more blink effects and maybe uh, due to uh, not having access to other colors it's just running these i think at the end of the day every brewer has to consider that they are in a very heavy um like mid-range counter spell infested meta and anything that you have that can get around counter magic will probably give you some amount of advantage um, over what you're playing against so for example i can talk about soul partition all i want to but at the end of the day it loses to every counter spell um on the planet but unyielding yeah, exactly. gatekeeper wouldn't unyielding gatekeeper would really just have problems with um deflecting swat and yeah and that'd be about it so yeah i think and maybe as as time goes by i i i wonder if at some point we start seeing decks with more disguised creatures and who knows even morphed creatures that people will get go back uh, in time to to scavenge the the morph ability and maybe this uh, becomes even more playable because he, it's more unknown information for your opponent to deal with uh, again uh, e harder to counter unless people just change their uh, their their play styles and their counter magic uh, uh, suite the it just countering a, a, a disguised creature is something i i doubt it. we will see unless uh, something just uh, takes over the the, the the format so i think at some point this creature can become more relevant than whatever it is going to to happen with it uh, in the just the, the near future yep Assemble the Players is a 2-mana, 1-in-a-white enchantment that says you may look at the top card of your library at any time, and once each turn you may cast a creature spell with power 2 or less from the top of your library. Now, this might be a better thing for you to talk about. I'm personally not the biggest fan of cast from top of library enablers, um, but I know that you, are, you enjoy these as an extra form of card advantage. So... Yeah, I I was really hyped uh, about this card, and uh, well, I do love White Winnie for a long time. I I love my old Darian uh, mono white deck, and um, so when I see these, I kind of get a bit hyped. For CDH, uh, we're talking about CDH, of course. Even for CDH, I think this can be playable because, uh, I mean. The, in, in certain decks, of course, in, in uh, white, mono white for sure, I think it can be seen, and maybe white X. I don't see that a three color deck can have room for these as their card advantage uh, slot, because in two other supporting colors uh, for white, I think you would definitely find something perhaps better, unless, unless you maybe are a, a stacks three color deck that wants to slam more, even more hate bears from the top uh, because yeah basically 
when you're playing with your seven card hand and you draw the eighth card, you play your stuff, you pass the turn, you draw, you play, you draw, play. Having that extra card from top of your library is 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 card advantage somehow. And it unfortunately, well, unfortunately, it's just once a turn. But who knows? We just spoke about um, doorkeeper throw uh, just earlier. You could actually uh, be on a mono white uh, stacks list and uh, on an opponent's turn flash the flash in the doorkeeper thrall from the top of your library a card that is not in your hand and you didn't draw it but you have access to it that's why i mentioned as a card advantage uh, engine i think this is decent uh, power two or less i i didn't run the numbers but i think you can um you can find uh, a lot of good uh, creatures to that, that you can just uh, cast from the top of your library and um, in this kind of uh, shell. So I don't. This uh, this could have you... play. This could have playability in Gandalf, right? Um, you're familiar with mono white Gandalf and how uh, the uh, flash. Um... Yeah, Gandalf basically gives... Let me make sure that this uh, Gandalf doesn't actually have restrictions about the card being in your hand. But, uh, Mono White Gandalf says you may cast legendary spells and artifact spells so they have flash. So, the problem is that Gandalf's creature count index normally isn't super high, but if you are playing something that gives all of your, uh, all of your creature spells flash, then yes, Assemble the Players does gain um, a good bit more value. From being able to cast things off the top of your library in gandalf's case it would be like a mirror retriever that you could cast off the top so that's something to consider or maybe if you were playing a staxier version of it as well so for me personally this is going to be a skip, <laughs> a skip. i i okay. see its playability this is just me this is me and the the decks and whether or not i would really suggest that anyone play this would i be surprised if anyone did play it no um, in fact, that's the purpose of, of these episodes is to, to point out like, hey, a person could be playing this and you should know why. Uh, but for me, I don't see this getting played in any list that I, um, I currently play. And, and I probably wouldn't suggest it to others unless they were playing, you know, something mono white with very low card, card quality and had a bunch of spaces. Just me. What about you? Are you leaning more towards testable? Uh, for sure, testable. Uh, I just uh, quickly took a glance at uh, Heliot Stacks uh, list from uh, the database, and from 29 creatures, uh, I, I counted roughly five that wouldn't be able to be cast from this. So basically, about 20 to 24 creatures in the list are in <clears throat> FA power two or less. So I think definitely testable and maybe I, I maybe playable okay as as mono white maybe hello i promise that nothing has gone wrong with the video um Bal is just stunned that you actually made it this far uh, to the end of such a long review and we've only made it through white while we were not only recording but in post-processing as well uh, we sat there and realized that if we put all of these together into one video you might be sitting here for four hours having us break down the most recent sets so what we decided to do is break them up into colors so we will end up releasing white first and followed by i believe blue next and we'll keep going down the line the videos will vary in length white will probably be the longest so thank you very much for actually sitting through this we uh wanted to try something new we're very open to feedback we don't often show our faces on the channel you probably don't even recognize me just because i haven't appeared in any of the live footage so again thank you very much for watching we hope you'll enjoy the next one that'll be coming out probably within the next day or even within the next uh, couple hours as soon as it can get edited so stay in tune for that and uh, please leave us uh, a note in the comments if you liked this if you want to see more of it if you don't like our faces that's fine too leave a comment saying so we're happy to hear any feedback you have so thanks for watching And a special thank you to our patrons over on Patreon and for those that are on our Discord server for your constant support. We really appreciate it. We honestly could not do this without you. So, special thanks to you. <laughs>